Hi, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well this evening. My name is Eve Engler. This is the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. And uh, I'm coming to you from uh, Jojage, which has long been a meeting place of uh, and, various, uh, various First Nations. I'm coming to you from uh, Jojage, which has long been a meeting place of uh, otherwise known as, uh, as Montreal. Hope everyone is, uh, is doing well this evening. It's uh, nice and sunny here, uh, getting to be a little too hot, uh, as it is in lots of places, as we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, so I thought I'd start off with um, the protests in Peru. They, the uh, third uh, taking of uh, Lima took, began on Wednesday where protesters from all across the country, from the different regions, largely indigenous uh, uh, opponents of the uh, usurper government uh, descended on Lima, big protest on Wednesday, and there's been ongoing uh, rallies and demonstrations in uh, uh, since. And uh, this is just a continuation of this opposition to the ouster of the elected president, uh, Pedro Castillo, back in December, that Canada worked hard to, uh, to uh, legitimate diplomatically uh, immediately. A uh, huge number of uh, meetings between Canada's ambassador, foreign affairs minister, and the, uh, the coup government officials. That sort of uh, lessened over the, uh, uh, the first two months was the sort of big diplomatic push. That's lessened. Uh, but there's continued uh, diplomatic outreach ambassador meeting with the minister uh, just not long ago, six weeks ago or so, uh, Melanie Jolie, foreign minister, met with her Peruvian counterpart. And this, of course, all comes in the context of uh, credible amounts of violence. Amnesty International put out a report about the, the racist repression after the coup, then Amnesty Canada in May called on the Canadian government to uh, end any... Uh, any uh, arms sales to Peru uh, uh, that could be used, of course, against uh, against um, uh, uh, protesters. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the Canadian government has sort of basically ignored all of this. The in June, U.S. troops started to uh, hundreds of U.S. troops. I think it's supposed to go up to twelve hundred, a bit over a thousand. Uh, they were okay to enter the country by the Congress, and um, and there was a there's been some uh, exercises with Peruvian and other countries' militaries, and according to uh, the Canadian government Twitter account, some members of the Royal Canadian Air Force are part of this this uh, some of this training mission. Uh, I couldn't find any more information about it. I think it's part of this American led uh, training mission that began on uh, June 26, but I, 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 I searched around, not exhaustively, but I searched around, couldn't find any more information about Canada's uh, role, but there are Canadian troops uh, apparently that have, are either in Peru or have been in Peru recently. And uh, in the context of the repression and dispatching US troops and lots of different uh, left-wing media outlets framing that as, you know, supporting the American military being there to support the repression. The fact there's Canadian troops there is, uh, is something that's uh, certainly of uh, noteworthy. Um, so we'll see where the protests go. Of course, when you look at, I hadn't done this in a while, but when you look at the Canadian, uh, Canada and Peru Twitter account, which is all in Spanish, and then also the ambassador, Luis Marcot's Twitter account, you notice that they really do a lot of attention on the mining sector, which is um, which is probably not surprising because Canadian diplomats spend a lot of time in mining everywhere. But there's, you know, I think it's towards ten billion dollars of Canadian mining investment in Peru, uh, and there's some evidence to suggest that the the uh, there's a growing sort of geopolitical battle with China over uh, sort of control and uh, access of uh, some of the minerals that are increasingly important in so-called green technologies or new forms of technologies that are framed as green and would probably be a better way of framing it. Um, 
And so uh, the Canadian ambassador is very focused on that uh, uh, question. It was reported by uh, mining.com that the uh, two Canadian mining companies have launched lawsuits against uh, Mexico in Investment Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, the World Bank's body to, uh, to, uh, that allows corporations to sue countries for uh, lost profits. And um, uh, uh, First Majestic Silver and Silver Bull have both recently launched lawsuits against the Mexican government. Little in terms of detail, but this seems to be more of this sort of pushback against very modest um, uh, reforms that the AMLO government, the sort of leftish government of Mexico has brought in to increase local uh, 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 benefits from mining and to lessen the, the ecological destruction. And um, so two Canadian mining companies have sued the Mexican government. Uh, I think one of them was for over $100 million. I, didn't, I don't remember the number for the other one or if it was reported. Uh, but this is, uh, I think, a, a negative development, but it, reflective Canadian mining companies are suing governments all around the world. And that's a big part of what uh, these uh, foreign investment promotion protection agreements that the Canadian government signs with countries all around the world. What's a, in large part what it's all about is giving mining sector one more tool to, uh, uh, def to protect their, their profits or their interests uh, by these, uh, these lawsuits uh, for lost profits in international uh, tribunals. On Wednesday, it's going to be the uh, 70th anniversary of uh, Fidel Castro and, and uh, rebels' uh, assault on, the, on Moncada. In, uh, in Cuba, their initial effort to uh, dethrone um, uh, General uh, Batista, the uh, longtime dictator in, um, in Cuba. And I thought it was worth mentioning because there will probably be some, uh, there's some webinars and some discussion about it online that the Canadian government's reaction to Batista and the Canadian government was fairly sympathetic. So we have uh, some of the comments that the the um, ambassador said uh, 20 months before Batista was, was, was ousted, Canada's ambassador said, uh, referred to him as still the best hope for the future of Cuba uh, because he has, quote, offered the stability demanded by foreign investors. So Canada's ambassador was primarily concerned not with human rights violations, dictatorship, but with foreign investors' interests. And that had been the case of the Canadian government in Cuba since the American invasion in the late 1800s and then U.S. occupation and Canadian banks and other uh, 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 corporate interests did very well by the, uh, the uh, U.S. invasion and occupation. And, uh, and so there was very significant Canadian banking and other uh, corporate interests in the country. Um, about a year before Batista was... Uh, uh, was uh, ousted by Castro's forces, uh, the Canadian ambassador referred to, quote, the benevolence of President Bastista, Batista is not to be questioned. He may be lining his pockets at Cuba's expense, but it is traditional for Cuban presidents to do so, and it is in part made necessary by the uncertainty of political life here. But as a dictator, he is a failure. If the standard is Hitler or Mussolini, Public protests against the regime are possible. An opposition is in existence and is weak only because of fundamental weaknesses in the personalities of the opposition. Uh, so this is the Canadian ambassador providing a fairly glowing assessment of uh, Batista. And uh, contrary to the mythology, the Canadian government never really supported uh, uh, Castro's uh, forces and uh, and I'm not going to get into all the details on that now, but but um, uh, safe to say that the Canadian government was fine with uh, Batista's dictatorship so long as it was uh, benefiting Canadian uh, uh, corporate interests or was or was working well for Canadian uh, corporate interests. Uh, the the rabble published a story a few days ago about um, Canada's position to the on the OECD around uh, international tax reform. The Financial Times published a story, I think maybe two weeks ago or so, about how the OECD, the group of, I think it's 20 or 
30 uh, rich countries uh, that they had basically pressured Australia against this measure to, to um, force multinational corporations to disclose where they were paying their taxes. Uh, so this wasn't you know, forcing necessarily added tax out of the companies, but just to disclose you know, how were they putting profits into tax havens where there's very little corporate profit taxes, so they basically don't have to pay uh, corporate uh, taxes. Uh, so the, the OECD apparently, according to Financial Times, was pressuring Australia not to, to move in this direction. And the rabble story basically points out that the Canadian government says that, quote, Canada has thus far not supported a UN-led body for international tax reform, instead expressing support for the process. You know, again, not surprisingly, they, the liberals will talk a pretty good game about, you know, trying to press forward with with corporate corporations uh, paying higher taxes or not, you know, stashing all their money in in uh, uh, tax havens or uh, or the like. But when it comes down to it, they they are they are not leading the charge in international uh, forums to to uh, uh, strengthen regulation, strengthen rules around multinationals uh, uh, paying higher taxes and 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 disclosing. Uh, more of their uh, their tax uh, uh, shenanigans. So um, uh, on uh, uh, today, uh, 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 Laurel Thompson, who is a a common participant in the Canadian Foreign, Pol all Canadian Foreign Policy Hour and a uh, Montreal uh, activist. Her and I uh, learned about um, Minister Guillebeau uh, giving this announcement about uh, ending inefficient uh, fossil fuel uh, subsidies. And so <clears throat> uh, Laurel suggested we go down and we uh, we put a put our perspective forward, which we did, and here is some. Uh... Shut the tar sands down or resign. Shut the tar sands down or resign. Push to shut the tar sands down or resign. Resign, Minister Gibo. Resign or shut the tar sands down. Resign or shut the tar sands down. Demission. Demission. Shut the tar sands down or resign. It's time to resign, Minister Gibo. Shut the tar sands down or resign. Resign, Minister Gibo. Climate criminal. Shut the tar sands down or resign. We're in a climate crisis. People are dying all over. The world is on fire. The world is on fire. Shut the tar sands down or resign. Shut the tar sands down or resign. Minister Gibo, you're a climate criminal. Shut the tar sands down or resign. You accepted, accepted the expansion of the Bajunal. The Bajunal, even more. Greenhouse gas emitting, uh, oil emitting, what is the world? We don't need this. The world is on fire. Shut the tar sands. Uh, so that was. Uh... Laurel that you saw at the front who brought uh, her sign up next to Gilbo. Uh, fortunately, this, this disruption got it picked up by CBC, by Global News, Canadian Press, very brief mention, but it got, it's gotten some media attention. Um, and, and of course, the announcement today, I think was a, you know, a, a positive. It's not, it's, I'm sure it's a half measure. Uh, the devil's, of course, in the details around these subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, and it should have been done a long time ago, and there's lots of things like that. I think it's probably a, a, a positive, uh, but, but literally all around the world, it's just remarkable what we're seeing in terms of uh, heat waves, breaking of records, uh, climate disturbances that are killing people here in Canada, and also all around the world. and we have a situation where the liberals are, you know, whether it's their, their, their to blame entirely or not, Canada's tar sands are expanding.
They are expanding right now, right? And they plan to still expand until 2030. I mean, this has to, it, this has to be absolutely shut down now, right? This needed to be done a long time ago. And obviously this is outside of the bounds of polite political discussion in this country, but the federal government needs to either, uh, you know, needs to intervene in whatever form it needs to be it, raise the carbon tax, be it direct uh, policy measures around uh, extraction of, 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 um, of fossil fuels, particularly the, uh, especially uh, 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 greenhouse ga gas emitting uh, tar sands, but this needs to happen uh, 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 immediately. And again, the worst, you know, to put this in an internationalist perspective, the worst of disturbances are being felt by those who, who are little responsible you know, countries in Africa who, who, whose emissions are, are a fraction of Canada's emissions. And the idea that a wealthy country like Canada that has such massive historic and current per capita emissions, that it would continue sucking out some of the most uh, heavy carbon emitting forms of fuel is just an, a scandal beyond belief. Um, and we need to be uh, we need to be more um, aggressive. Uh, my bit my bit about him resigning, I thought that was something that the media might pick up on. I don't think that was actually the right the right sort of uh, kind of media angle. But I do think that that um, uh, Gilbo uh, that the idea that um, it, you know if 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 you're going to have to if being in cabinet means justifying the Bay du Nord oil expansion that's 300 million to a billion new barrels of of oil, which he okayed, if it means uh, staying in cabinet um, or or you know to fight other fights, like which is how he would frame it, or or um, resigning, I think what the French minister did in Macron's government uh, four or five years ago, environmentalist French minister, um, I think that's probably the better the better way to uh, to proceed. Uh, on a, on a different issue, the Canadian press yesterday published a story about uh, Development Minister uh, Harjit Sajjan. I think uh, she's the feminist minister. Uh, is it Marcy Ian? And the Liberal MP uh, 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 Kaiba, Kaiba um, meeting with Paul Kagame during a Women Deliver conference taking place in, uh, in Rwanda. And uh, they met with a number of different uh, Rwandan uh, ministers. And, uh, and the, the story was critical. Uh, it, it pointed out that, that Kagame is a dictator and the framing they talked about, they, they apparently they talked about regional security uh, according to the release from the Canadian government. Now, of course, regional security in this case means uh, Kagame instigating you know, this destabilizing the Congo, uh, at Eastern Congo again over the past 18 months, which has displaced about a million people and thousands of people dead. And that's part of a decades long uh, process of, 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 of pillaging that Rwanda has done in Eastern Congo. And um, so, so that's, that's, it's pretty outrageous that they would refer to uh, regional security in the release and completely ignore what the ongoing role of Rwanda and with supporting the M23 and their violence in Congo. Uh, probably part of the discussion had to do with Rwanda has now put forward that they will send uh, UN forces to Haiti. Uh, so Rwanda has put itself forward as a major player in that uh, process, which of course the US and Canadian government have, uh, have been um, trying to push having a UN force in Haiti. And so Kagame has stepped up on that front, which he's done in a whole bunch of fronts, right? Offered Rwandan forces to serve uh, U.S. and, and uh, Western uh, geopolitical uh, aims through the through the uh, through the UN. Uh, the other part, the the story didn't really get into the M23 much, just mentioned briefly. But the Canadian press story also mentioned more of the focus and the critical discussion was Kagame speaks about this whole like feminist, right? He does this whole feminist rhetoric, and the half of the cabinet. Are, are women and, 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 and stuff like that, but it's a brutal dictatorship. So the idea of like 
you know, women's emancipation uh, through this highly authoritarian structure that doesn't actually allow women, you know, even basic free speech um, is kind of comical. Uh, but Kagame has done well by this sort of liberal rhetoric on this front. Uh, and the story kind of, uh, Canadian Press story kind of points out uh, 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 some, of, some of that. Um, in another uh, questioning, Minister, do you consider Israel a racist state? Minister uh, Al Gabar, do you, do you consider Israel a racist state? Why is your why did your government support this apartheid state? Ministers, why why are you why are you saying that anyone who calls Israel racist uh, uh, violates the uh, anti-Palestinian definition, uh, IHRA's definition of anti-Semitism? Can you answer that? Do you consider Israel a racist state? No? What do you, what do you, what's your opinion about the uh, Amnesty and Human Rights Watch report? Come on, ministers. No, you don't, you usually into talking. No, why aren't you into talking now? No answer? Do you, Ms. Minister Algebra, do you consider Israel a racist state? Minister, do you consider Israel a racist state? Minister Algebra, do you, do you consider Israel a racist state? So that was actually, Laurel was also there at the train station, challenging the transport minister. Got myself a little confused with the IHRA, the Pablo Rodriguez, the minister next to him, uh, uh, forced grantees for Heritage Canada grants to adhere to the IHRA's anti-Palestinian definition of anti-Semitism, meaning that thousands, probably tens of thousands of Canadians um, are, are, if they, that get grants from Heritage Canada for like, you know, little festivals, music festivals or whatever, uh, that they actually, if they call Israel a racist state, that they, they, they could lose their government funding. Um, because according to IHRA definition, that's uh, that's uh, anti-Semitic. Um, so uh, uh, Laurel afterwards challenged uh, the, them on the uh, NATO proxy war uh, in, uh, in, um, with Russia. Um, so in other Palestine related news, uh, the liberal or the NDP, um, member of the provincial legislature in Ontario, uh, Sarah Jama got another round of attacks, uh, because she spoke at a, uh, uh, a sort of anti, uh, uh, a police, uh, group event and that group the is also pro uh, boycott divestment sanctions and uh, the police the the Hamilton Police Association attacked her and they seem to have also brought in drew, drew in B'nai Brith and the Hamilton uh, Jewish Federation who uh, condemned her for speaking at this event where this group was they frame of course BDS as being anti-semitic and uh, and so there's been a, some pushback uh uh, Rabbi Miv Miviser and some of the activists in Hamilton sent a letter, but again, it's just this constant smearing from from B'nai B'rith of this uh, young left leftish uh, um, MNA for the NDP, and and of course, you know what this. Unfortunately, the likelihood of what this is all going to lead to is her to become more and more cautious, more and more uh, careful about who she speaks at, what activist group she attends, because. That activist group may have some position on some issue that's then used against her. And obviously, Palestine is particularly hot button. But you find that with the sort of police associations and the, the anti-Palestinian groups, it's sort of like they come together. The right-wing forces kind of come together on these things. And, um, and that will probably, unfortunately, lead her to be more and more cautious about uh, 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 speaking on uh, on different uh, to different activist groups and activist issues. In in another in a, in sem semi related uh, uh, development, um, I just publishing a piece. I think I, I, I mentioned it a bit yesterday or last week. The the that I'm flush I flushed out in a piece that I'm going to uh, uh, publish soon uh, about these these uh, these anti Muslim individuals and groups taking on the campaign for Muslim rights in China. 
and it's really it's kind of it's, it's quite fascinating to see and 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 look at how they they really take on the Uyghur issue, and and uh, people like um, David Matas from B'nai B'rith lawyer, uh, Sarah Tyke, uh, and they are the they're the legal counsel for this campaign on on uh, for the Canadian corporate ombudsperson to take on uh, forced labor. Uh, forced Uyghur labor in China. And, and Matas is like, he was a, a vocal advocate against uh, Bill 103, right? Which was about, uh, uh, back in 2017, about, about um, uh, 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 describing Islamophobia. And so he was all over. He actually spoke to parliament criticizing the bill. And, and, um, and, and it's, uh, but yet he's like supposed to be this like Muslim rights activist for for you know in China. Same thing with Erwin Kotler. Erwin Kotler joined this, and I and I discovered that on June nineteenth, the the corporate ombudsperson. This is again the ombudsperson that that the, uh, I think is Canadian uh, ombudsperson of responsible enterprise core. That it was set up. It was campaign designed to hold Canadian mining companies abroad uh, responsible for abuses. And it's been basically gutted by the liberal government. And now it's increasingly a tool to target China around uh, companies that may be engaged in some way or another with forced, supposed forced uh, Uyghur uh, labor. But apparently on June 19th, the core ombudsperson actually testified at a special committee on the Canada People's Republic of China relationship uh, on the question of forced labor and other human rights abuses in China. So, so again, this, this position that's set up to hold this, initially instigated to hold this, this massive Canadian mining industry, global abuses responsible, that has all this government support, has now been completely turned into this tool to target uh, China's alleged mistreatment of Uyghurs. And it's just totally fascinating to see to the point where this ombudsperson is now like supposedly an ex expert on 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 the question of of uh, China's treatment of of, of Uyghurs, um, and and my my um, uh, former uh, comrade in the Can uh, Concordia Student Union, uh, uh, Samir Zuberi, who was with me on the executive of the Concordia Student Union twenty years ago, who was rallying people when Netanyahu came and spoke at Concordia in two thousand two in the infamous so called riot, uh, who was rallying people against Netanyahu. This week, last couple of days, Samir Zuberi, who's now a liberal MP, he's down in Washington. Okay, he's down, he's down in Washington meeting with all these US government officials, including Nancy Pelosi, around Uyghur rights. Okay, so he's become the big advocate in parliament around Uyghur rights, sponsored a bill about Uyghur refugees and, and just big, big player. He's on the, he heads up the human rights uh, committee, uh, the subcommittee of parliament. And and he's really uh, he's he's melded his sort of he 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 went to after Concordia what was involved in Muslim rights activism he's really melded his Muslim rights activism with the interests of the U.S. empire I mean and I don't see how you like at this point it's just like he's just become a total toady of the U.S. empire as if as if the country that bombed. Uh, uh, Iraq, war Iraq, killing hundreds of thousands, probably million, million plus Muslims, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, uh, uh, just incredible number of Muslims that the American empire has killed over the past two decades. We are to believe, we are to believe that they just care about Muslim rights in China. I mean, it's so ludicrous. It's so ludicrous on its face that you just have to laugh. But here you have Zuberi, this, the, you know, who was involved, he was never on the left at Concordia. He was never the, the, the you know, he was always part of the more, the more uh, uh, accommodating to the Concordia administration and the power structure during our, my time in the CSU. But he's a nice guy. He's a very nice guy. I think he's, you know, at one level genuine uh, in, in, in his concern around, you know, uh, 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 Islamophobia. Uh, but he's very ambitious, right? He's also very ambitious. And, and, and so he's now got himself to the point where he has all these tweets talking about the, you know, the great human rights activism of these American government bodies around China, around Uyghurs, 
and these American Congress people. And it's just just completely uh, uh, farcical. Uh, but this is where we're at, right? This is this is the state of kind of political discussion and the lack of holding any of these politicians accountable. And and, you know, the whole Canadian uh, House of Commons, you know, genocide, Chinese genocide, the whole House of Commons, not one dissenting voice back in 2021. Uh, even when you start prodding into this question, you find there's all these anti-Muslim forces that are right at the center of this. Pompeo, former Secretary of State, the former head of the CIA, right? A major player on all this, the Adrian Zenz, these, you know, these serious, both of those guys, serious Christian, hardline Christian uh, uh, Christians, uh, these, these uh, 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 Jewish Zionists like David Matas and Sarah Tyke who are you know, totally integrated in anti-Muslim activism, but all of a sudden they're just all about, about the Muslim rights in China. It just, you know, it speaks to how the American empire has taken this issue up and the whole uh, discussion just, just, just um, there's so little genuine uh, challenging of this. On the whole <clears throat> China, anti-China foreign interference, um, there's a development on that, a, a retired RCMP officer uh, by the name of um, uh, William Matcher, who's, uh, <clears throat> I guess he was uh, involved in uh, RCMP undercover operations for many years, and has been based in, uh, in uh, Hong Kong, doing uh, r- running a private firm that does um, investigations and sort of p- uh, p- private investigation kind of work. He he's on the front page of the globe today, and it's, it was a uh, broke news a couple of days ago, and multiple stories, m- multiple outlets. He's being uh, charged under Canadian law around supporting a foreign entity, uh, being <clears throat> it's a bit unclear exactly what, but basically supporting the Chinese government, uh, uh, trying to get um, people who I guess have moved to Canada, and. Uh, there's two ways of framing this. The Chinese government frames it as, as this is sort of like people who were, you know, corrupt and took a bunch of money out of the country. And the Chinese government is trying to, you know, get them legally and get some of that money back. Uh, and then the other framing is, is this is like, you know, like a political witch hunt. And the Chinese government is trying to get those who, you know, have gone offside with, with it. Um, but anyways, this former RCMP officer apparently seems fairly openly has talked about how he, he, you know, the different entities in, in one way or another associated with the Chinese government, he's, uh, he's done work for them to help them in their, in their, uh, in their investigation works. And I guess in, in maybe trying to get people back into China, et cetera. And so he's now being charged uh, on this. It's all, it's all a little bit uh, 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 unclear. Uh, he was detained when he arrived in Canada. And then they released him because they said he didn't have enough evidence. But then they're claiming that they've been investigating him for two years. And then they re-detained him a couple of days later because I guess they found new evidence. But again, so they said they've been investigating for more than two years. So, so it's all a little bit unclear. We'll see where this all goes. But it's a whole new round of this sort of China interference in Canada. And that's how the media is kind of framing it. The Canadian press today has a story titled... Um, Canadian intelligence flag flag Chinese meddling decades ago, newly re, newly released report, and the story basically says since 1986, there's a uh, uh, Canadian intelligence agency saying that the Chinese government is trying to kind of reach out to uh, uh, Chinese uh, diaspora uh, groups or individuals uh, for their political ends. I don't doubt that. At one level, I, I've said this many times, I don't doubt that the Chinese government would be, you know, reaching out in different kind of political ways uh, um, to, to, you know, some Chinese Canadian uh, uh, groups, individuals. Uh, that makes sense to me. But this is now this has been going on for decades. Now, there's two ways to look at that, right? It's that to me makes more sense. It's been going on for a long time and that it's not particularly important in the grand scheme of things. It's not that influential. It's not that. Um, relevant to Canadian politics. That's my perspective on it and perception of it. Uh, uh, The way that the media frames this is like, oh, they've been doing this for so long. Well, I think the reframing is that, yeah, they've been doing this for so long and it's not really that important. 
and it's been going on for a long time and Canada in different forms and US in different forms and other countries in different forms do variations of this uh, around the world. Um, but that doesn't go with the whole kind of anti-China narrative that, that we're trying to, they're trying to instigate uh, that of course Sumir Zuberi and the, and the Uyghur campaign is part of. Um, on that front, Liberal MP John McKay has a really like hard line, crazy op-ed in the National Post a couple of days ago, where he's just 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 over the top about China. He says, "quote The only strategy that is, that is left works on the assumption that China will continue to be a bully, and no agreement, no treaty, and no contract based on any trust will be worth the paper it's written on." In the, in the op-ed, he re re refers to the, quote, enslavement of Uyghurs, organ harvesting of Falun Gong practitioners, the long-standing abuses against Tibetans, destruction of Christian places of worship, the disappearance of human rights activists, and much more. He, he also says, quote, China is on the way to becoming an existential threat to Canada. Uh, this is a liberal MP um in the national post this is where we're going with all this it's an existential threat to canada well what would he do with an existential threat to canada we build up our military and we try to uh uh wipe out that existential threat to to canada uh that's the the logical conclusion uh that's where a lot of things are going and the financial times had a uh piece titled china and the revenge of geopolitics that points out a couple of things I thought were interesting. It says rivalry, rivalry between the US and China is a project without end. Short of Armageddon, there is no scenario in which either the US or China will emerge as the world's sole hegemon, right? I think that's correct. This is without end. There's no end to this. They, 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 they you know, either you, I mean, there's a small, very, very small chance the Americans can pull off something that just destroys China's economy and and the US continues on, you know, indefinitely as the world's hegemon. That's very, very unlikely. Unlikely that can play it, that can be successful. Uh, much more likely is is well, China China keeps rising economically, certainly, and with time more and more. Uh, militarily and then and, and 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 then more and more geopolitically uh or we have armageddon or we just you know go for it let's let's roll the dice let's you know uh nuclear war uh <laughs> let's let's do this uh which clearly a faction of the american ruling class is, is into into uh uh pushing that process along and a faction of the canadian ruling class is willing to to do that as 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 well but there is no end, right? So it's unlike, you know, Ukraine, which there is, you know, pres presumably there's some sort of negotiated end or there's some sort of truce or some sort of uh, unpleasant, uh, uh, you know, modus of modus of vendi moving forward uh, with China. That this this is this is probably just going to that this competition is probably just going to continue. Uh, so. The uh, Dimitri Lascaris published a piece about the McDonnell Lorry Institute around its funding and how it's refusing to, to uh, disclose, even though it says it would disclose its funding if you go to their office. Both Tamara Lawrence and Dimitri uh, have gone to their offices recently in recent months, and they, 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 they say, we can't give you the documents, not ready, and then they've said we'll come back later on, and neither of them live in Ottawa. Uh, and um, and uh, then now they finally formally said, no, we will not release who our funders are. And they gave some different reasons. And Dimitri uh, uh, published a piece about that. And he points out that between 2010 and 2019, when they did release their funders, it, point, it shows that the US, Ukrainian, Latvian, and Taiwanese governments all funded the McDonald Laurie Institute. McDonald Laurie Institute, of course, is big on the whole foreign meddling question. The foreign meddling, of course, is not U.S., Ukrainian, Latvian, and Taiwanese funding of them to complain about China's interference in Canada. Uh, that's not foreign meddling. That's something else. That's called, uh, I guess that's called democracy. Um, uh, but uh, that seems to be part of what's going on. And now, they're, now they don't even want to tell us who's funding them to complain about foreign meddling. Uh, Dimitri also published a, a thing, I think, on Twitter, where he points out that... Um, 
that last month, Marcus Kolga of the McDonald Laurie Institute and JC Boucher of University of Calgary, who both were going at him hard about, about his recent tour, but both of them uh, visited the Canadian Joint, joint, joint uh, uh, Headquarters Task Force Latvia. So they were on an official visit put on by the public affairs of the Canadian military, uh, the PR branch of the Canadian military, they visited Latvia to meet the Canadian military there and check out the operations while simultaneously attacking Dimitri incessantly and trying to shut down all his events. They very close to the Canadian uh, military. Boucher's received millions in, 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 in uh, research funding from the Canadian military. And Marcus Kolga, of course, has been funded by the U.S. government, his, his uh, disinformation institute funded by the U.S. government. Um, so that's an interesting uh, uh, piece of, uh, of, uh, of news and, and just ties between the campaign of shutting down and the Canadian military. Uh, the Financial Times reported uh, on defense stocks, a huge uh, increase in, the, in the, uh, um, the stock price of defense companies in 2022, and particularly the European companies, the Rheinmetall, the big German one, Tals. Uh, I think French one, Leonardo, the Italian one, BA Systems, the German one's up like 83%. One of the other ones up 77%. Uh, the American big ones, General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, they're also up significantly, but not as significant as the European ones. So they're really doing well, as the point of the story, well by the war uh, in, in Ukraine. And, uh, and what we're seeing there is, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if people noticed this or seen this, uh, the Wall Street Journal report on Saturday, that the Americans are, are, they were knowingly pushing the Ukrainians to, to go hard on the counteroffensive, and knowing that they were going to likely get slaughtered and that they, they, they weren't in a position to actually succeed. And that's, of course, what's happened. And now there's, you know, lots and lots of attention in the corporate media about how the counteroffensive is not successful. And you even had CBC, one of the Hawks uh, reporter, uh, David Common, I believe, had a piece in, in CBC a couple of days ago saying, well, we sort of basically starting to talk about negotiations. Some of the really hard line NATO uh, backers, uh, Ukrainian academic there, I think out in Victoria, she had a big panic about it. Or no, he actually here at Munch uh, McGill, uh, Mary P Pova, I believe is her name, on Twitter, she had a big panic, demanding the CBC, demanding the CBC take down the article. It was a really, it was a really you know, total milk toast article. It just a, mentions the idea of negotiations. And there's going to have to be some land, I believe he mentioned some land exchange and stuff like that. And total panic. The CBC take it down after spending weeks calling on shutting down all of Dimitri's events. Now it's CBC take down your, your, your discussion of, of, of negotiations. Um, but that, that's, uh, you know, that's sort of kind of now breaking through into the corporate media that this is all a disaster, huge losses of, of human life for the Ukrainians primarily, but probably also uh, Russian forces. Um, and uh, you had a story about uh, Trudeau went down to New York, I believe, to the UN uh, uh, for a UN award presentation to the uh, Verde Lion, the president of the European Commission. And he's like, boasting her this over the top speech how wonderful she is now of course that's because she's turned she's become a total nato hawk and 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 uh, and totally uh subordinated U european union policy to to washington and nato's uh, uh uh objectives and so trudeau is 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 gushing over over her great work on that front um there was a story published a couple of days ago about uh it starts off, I believe, Canada is dusting, is dusting off and updating emergency protocols to deal with fallout from a possible tactical nuclear exchange in Europe or the spread of radiation across the ocean in the, if the Zaporizhia uh, nuclear uh, power plant was to uh, uh, have a, you know, some sort of disaster. And uh, it's remarkable, you know, so the Canadian government's getting worried and, you know, preparing for some sort of nuclear, possible nuclear uh, strike or something like that, while simultaneously, of course, increasing the likelihood of that happening, right? And pursuing all kinds of aggressive, provocative moves, expanding NATO presence in Latvia, uh, more weapons, more sanctions, 
more uh, aggressive posture, um, but at least they're they're preparing for the possibility of of some terrible disaster. Uh, and uh, there was an op-ed in the just to get a sense of how wild the Canadian media is that the, the, the uh, Toronto Star published an op-ed from the head of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress on Saturday, titled "NATO Needs to Get Serious," and was all about how NATO should bring Ukraine in and how we NATO has not been doing, you know, selling Ukraine out. It's got to give more weapons, got to do more, uh, more killing, more uh, support. And it's just remarkable. And this is the Toronto Star. They're continuing this, some of this craziness. Uh, where this will all go, who knows? Um, just to conclude, I did want to uh, talk a little bit about the this whole idea. I'm, I'm flushing out the story about NATO as a permanent war alliance. And and if you go back, you know, Canada has been part of NATO for 74 years, and it's basically constantly had troops deployed. Uh, abroad, thousands, thousands or thousand plus, usually at one time, uh, on NATO missions, right? So from 1951 to 1993, you had Canadian troops in uh, station in Western Europe, part of NATO. Then a couple of years later, you have NATO mission begin, well, before actually end of Canadian troops returning, NATO mission first phase of NATO in, in the Balkans, and then you had a major Canadian NATO deployment. I believe it starts in 96. It might start in late 95. And uh, as part of the UN, or, uh, well, there's significant Canadians in the UN mission that's kind of aligned with the NATO mission in the Balkans in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, but then there's, there's, a, there's a, uh, a um, formal Canadian deployment. And then that, of course, climaxes with the the uh, the bombing 78 day 78 day NATO bombing of Yugoslavia, and uh, and and there's I think still a small number of Canadians part of there's like I think 1100 uh, NATO forces uh, in Bosnia. Uh, I think there may be some Canadian small number of Canadians there, and uh, and um, that's uh, that's continued. Uh, so 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 then you of course have Afghanistan. Canadians NATO mission, Libya, uh, uh, part of Iraq. I'm not sure if the Canadians were part of NATO, the NATO mission in Iraq. I believe they were. There's some form of NATO mission in Iraq. So it's basically the whole time since, since the sort of secret meetings of 1948, where Canada helps establish NATO, which is right after. Canada is like constantly deployed. Of course, Latvia, sorry, I mentioned Latvia today for, you know, now we're going, going towards a decade. It's going to be a decade of, of a semi-permanent uh, mission in Latvia by the end of the planned uh, extension in Latvia. Um, so it's just this like constant deployment. That's what NATO is, right? Um, this this constant uh, uh, military deployment, all justified under the lens of, of NATO. And, uh, and it's, of course, part of what's, you know, contributed to this uh, disaster and horrors in, 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 in Ukraine. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. I've gone on too long, and um, I will open it up to uh, uh, to uh, comments and questions. And I'm not. I don't think Laura's on. Uh, so if anybody, if I don't see people raising their former raising their hand, if someone could uh, could help with uh, uh, um, uh, that process, that's that's helpful. Um, are there any? Uh, comments or uh, or uh, questions or for that matter criticisms go ahead claire uh i was wondering if uh trudeau uh, instead of uh supporting the oil uh excavation in uh, tar sands, he would give them uh, money for renewables instead, because I believe they're still actually uh, funding the uh, exploration, as well as getting permits. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, they continue to expand. I think that this year, I can't remember the number now, it's 13% or 17% was the planned uh, investment increase, the highest investment in tar sands since, I think, 2015. Um, there was a story I quoted, in, I think, previous session. Uh, where the plan right now is, is to keep increasing the amount extracted until 2030 
and then start some process of, of, of leveling off, which is, of course, this is, this is total insanity. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that could be done uh, with the, the uh, there's a huge problem, of course, with, uh, with wells in Alberta, uh, primarily, I think also a bit in Saskatchewan, uh, the oil companies that have extracted and then just basically they pull this game where they go bank, go bankrupt, uh, they put all the, the, the wells that they don't want to uh, deal with the, the ecological damage and they put it into a company and and they go and it goes bankrupt and so then the public is on the hook for the whole uh, process so there's a lot of you know there's a lot of work that could be done in terms of jobs on that front and uh you know some people have complained that can become that can end up being a different form of subsidy for the fossil fuel industry and i agree with that it can be a way some of that government funding for that process can be a way to a, a backdoor way to subsidize the fossil fuel industry but if it's happening alongside a real shutdown, a real like not not a no, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna curb the rate of expansion, but we're gonna no, we're we're gonna we are going to shut this down in you know is it six months? Is it is it twelve months? Is it eighteen months? Like we, we enough, right? Like the, this business of oh, we have to accept the political parameters of of ecocide, you know, enough, right? The the species survival is more important than the profits of these companies that's for sure and the species survival is more important than even the the jobs of of you know that's how they always put it behind jobs and communities and this and stuff which is not it's always usually a cover for profits the real power is the is the banks and the the oil companies that have that are you know making the profits but but they put the cover of the you know jobs and whatnot so even on that front, we have to, that's just can't be, it can't be the trade-off uh, for, for long-time survival of, of, of the species supersedes the, the, you know, even, even those, and there are some that will probably be just, you know, just dis, disrupted, uh, uh, you know, working class people who will be disrupted, uh, that at some point has to just supersede. Uh, there are ways of transitioning, making sure that people have employment and making sure that that you know, even communities can 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 maintain, or you know, it's not like an overnight destruction of Fort McMurray, but that it's a it's a it's a you know a sort of maybe a a, a, a sort of slower pace decline uh, or a shift uh, you know in, in the community, etc. Uh, there are ways of doing that, but but it requires a starting premise that that Canada is one of the maybe the biggest per capita greenhouse gas emitter. Uh, historically, among the top today, uh, is a wealthy country. The tar sands are particularly bad greenhouse gas emitting form of oil. Uh, by any moral or ethical standard, Canada's oil in general, and particularly the heavy emitting tar sands, has to be at the front of the line of keeping it in the ground, right? I think we need to be keeping it in the ground, even in, even in Uganda, even in Nigeria, even in places where uh, they have emitted way less and people are, are generally are, are you know fair, far fewer resources, even those places need to be keeping it in the ground. But certainly the wealthy, high carbon emitting place has to be absolutely at the forefront of keeping it in the ground. And we have to not in any way uh, shy away from saying that. We have to be absolutely clear cut that this is, 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 a, is a complete, uh, uh, insanity from a, a human survival perspective. Um, so yeah, go ahead, uh, go ahead, uh, Joan. Well, Canada, Canada is the one that came up with this stupid uh, expression, net zero by fifth by by two thousand fifty, and. That just is business as usual with some dubious offset somewhere else. Now, this has been pushed at the UN all the time, and that's why they never get anywhere at these international conferences. That seems to be the main thing. And when I looked it up to find out with, with uh, who is really supporting this, and all the, the fossil fuel industry in, in, uh, in uh, Alberta is full on side, even the various ministers are coming out and saying that this is the wonderful solution. And this is what, of course, Trudeau did with Kinder Morgan when he said, he said uh, that, that um, 
they would um, what they would do with Kinder Morgan would be that they would put the money into they continue it you know when they bought it they continue it but they put their money into into um, uh, transfer into equitable equitable forms of energy of some sort but they, I mean this is or who knows or, or buying buying off going and buying uh, offsets from indigenous land somewhere around the world and just undermining and destabilizing countries. But this is this is what is preventing us from going anywhere. They're just not saying they're not saying anything else. Also, another problem internationally is is the IPCC in in um, in COP two uh, came out with a very very strong report uh, way back in 19, 1997, but they decided at that conference that. Anything that came out from the IPCC had to be okayed by governments. And so that just undermines it. So it's just, it's, I mean, we're just not getting anywhere. And as you say, it's just, it's just got to be done. And I can remember years ago, Elizabeth May said that the tar sand should be closed down. I had been arguing against it for years that it should be done. She finally said that. And she was so uh, demonized for even suggesting that. And they, I mean, the, the NDP never comes out with anything and no one is coming out with that. It should have been closed long ago. I mean, it's just, this doesn't make any sense. It's, I've been at, I was at protest internationally against the tar sands years ago uh, in Copenhagen at the conference. And we had so many people calling for the closing of the tar sands. But, and in fact, Greenpeace is the one that was the only group that uh, throughout the years has called for the closing of the tar sands. And guess who the minister, the environment minister is? Former. That's when I met him when he was an environmentalist. Anyway, it's just outrageous. As you say, it's the world, world survival, and it's always the developing countries that are suffering for, for what the developed countries will never do. And another thing, one other thing, I won't say any more than this, that I, when I was at a conference, that in one room, this was at, in the Paris conference. In one room, they were saying we're we're not going we have a bottom line. We're not going to we're not going to deal with fossil fuels. And then in the other room, uh, in the press conference, they were having press conference about how wonderful it was that the developing countries are so resilient. They're so resilient to what is imposed on them by the developed country. I mean, it's just so sad. I'm hoping in in two years. Um, Lula is going to be has offered to have the Get conference. Ready. Let your fine episode of the Unfair Advantage Experience show. Yeah, I, I I agree with you. I think it's um it's it's stunning what we're what we're seeing on the climate front, and, and I mean if you just look look at now the the disturbances, the planet burning. And uh, it's still the the power structure in this society. The, the the oil companies have now all claimed they 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 care about the climate crisis, and they've rebranded, and it's all basically just PR to keep keep the profits coming and damn damn human human uh, human survival. Uh, I I still see Linda with her hand up. Do you do you have another question, Linda? Or I don't see any other hands unless I'm missing something. Laura Thompson. I, I am I on? Yeah. I um I'm just turning the conversation a little bit to uh, Cuba, and you mentioned Canada's attitude toward uh, Batista, and I I wonder what you, how you see uh, the fact that under uh, Diefenbaker, a conservative government, Canada maintained diplomatic relations with Cuba, and those have continued to the day, uh, while the U.S. imposed the horrible uh, sanctions and blockade on Cuba, and it's been there for 60 some years. Um, how would you see that in terms of a conservative government uh, taking that stand? It was one of, we were one of two countries in the Western hemisphere who maintained yeah. relations. Me Mexico, Mexico and Canada don't break relations. And uh, the internal government documents, uh, which is reported on in the book, Three Nights in Havana, came out maybe a decade ago or so, 
uh, about Trudeau's trip there in 76, I believe. Uh, he points out that that the basically the Americans didn't ask Canada to break off diplomatic relations. And they didn't because they wanted the Canadian embassy to spy for them. Uh, so so Stephen Baker uh, continues diplomatic relations. And then during the Cuban Missile Crisis and in the lead up to it, uh, the Canadian uh, uh, embassy provides all kinds of intelligence as they put, as one officer puts it, the, the best intelligence uh, for the Americans uh, um, on Cuba. So, so that's part of, you know, it's framed as this kind of like just standing up to the Americans or, or, you know, caring about human rights, but in the background, there was a, a, um, a maybe a more nefarious explanation. The other side to it is that the, the Cubans never national nationalized, or so they did, they, they nationalized the Canadian banks, but they nationalized the Canadian banks with compensation. So they they were they treated Canadian corporate interests uh, uh, more amicably than they did U.S. corporate interests. So that also contributed to Canada's uh, uh, position. But if you look at it at the time, you know the you know the they're very they're very hostile. You have comments from B Diefenbaker where he's really hostile to Castro, like very over the top hostile to Castro. Um, uh, you know that shifted. I think you could say that the 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 Pierre Trudeau uh, stuff in the mid mid seventies is um, you know is better. But then even you get into that, they 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 cut off. They they get um, when the Cubans provide support to the anti apartheid South African apartheid forces in Angola. The the um, uh, the uh, the Canada, Pierre Trudeau in like 78, I believe, says he talks about being horrified by what Cuba's doing and they cut off some aid and stuff like that. Um, and you see that today, right? Like, you know, the, the certainly the Justin Trudeau's relationship to Cuba is, is far, far, far less aggressive than the U.S. They condemn, they always condemn that the U.N. resolution condemning the embargo and stuff like that. Um, I think it's only the U.S. and Israel that that don't condemn it, and um, uh, but but it's still very kind of ambivalent, certain degrees of criticism and stuff like that. Uh, go ahead, uh, Laurel. Right. I just want to say, um, with respect to to um, protesting, the the. Everything that you're that you're saying is is sort of a list of contradictions between what we say we're doing and what what we're actually doing. What 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 your friends used to say about the Muslims and what they're now doing and so on. And and I I just urge people to to get out there and when whenever they're in public, and they see a public a public person up there talking, identify you know, the, 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 the contradictions in what, they, in what they're saying between what they're saying and what they're doing and what they did in the past and what they're doing now. And because we, we don't seem to have comedians who are pointing these things out. So we, I, think, I think that's our job to do it. And, and I, like, I like the way in which uh, you always ask questions when you confront people, Eve, because the, the right wing doesn't do that. They just call bad names. But you often have a you have a, a, a good question, and I th I think that's a very good approach. What what is what are what what is, what is your answer to this this particular question? That's 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 what you're asking of people, and I think we just need to continually fire it at people. Just just wherever you are, when you're out out in public and you hear somebody talking, question them, make them put them on their toes. That's all. Yeah, well, I mean, today, today's uh, what, how we play this out today, where uh, Laurel went right up to um, Neil Bo with a sign, and and I was basically I was identified by the RCMP. They went kind of at the back of the room, and um, and it's sort of like it worked really well in terms of having a protester right next to it, and then and some like some statements, political statements, uh, being being yelled. And um, but yeah, I mean, they, 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 like 
you can find out about these ministers speaking pretty easily and it's pretty easy. you know it didn't take us very long to do this we walked into the room it all happened pretty quickly and it, you know there's in this case we got some corporate media there's the whole you know there's that's a whole bigger discussion i won't get into around social media versus corporate media in this case we knew there was corporate lots of corporate media there the the action was more designed from a corporate media standpoint uh and it was you know it's not it's it's just, it's not in the big scheme of things is not very important but in the small scheme of things in terms of what we can do uh this is small little uh uh impact um i think i should leave it at that i have uh, i have joshua uh he, who wants to ask me a question so and we're past uh we're past seven o'clock so um uh same place uh same time next week uh thanks everyone for uh for participating thank you okay Oui, Joshua. C'est quoi